Tara, you let yourself go. Oh, that's just rude. <laughs> what happened? Dude, everything in that fucking intro was way cooler than me. So I, I don't even know what to say now. I'm just like, well, I guess I got to go. Let's we'll go back and watch the intro. <laughs> when the intro is cooler than the guest, you know you guys got some problem. <laughs> You're reaching the bottom of the barrel, right? <sighs> well, the intro's over. All right, guys. So obviously, Tara's not here. She's feeling a little under the weather. So now you got to deal with me. And Johnny. And um, so sorry about that. And today we got the great and wonderful Tidwell on the show with us tonight. Would you like to introduce you to oh yeah. I don't know about all the great and wonderful parts, but uh I am one of the stupid people who believes my own bullshit. So <laughs> there we go. I guess that's something. I'd like to give a quick introduction about who you are, what you do. Um, my name is Gerald Tidwell. I'm a painter, art nerd, whatever. And I've been doing this for, uh, at the end of this month, is actually my 35th anniversary as a professional artist. And uh, the professional part, not so sure about. But uh, yeah, I started in the last week of March, 1988. And I've um, been doing this kind of shit for uh, <laughs> way too long. And I still look in the mirror every morning and wonder how the fuck it works. Like, literally, I still don't know how it works. So if anyone out there thinks they know what they're doing, please call me and let me know how to do it. <laughs> well, how'd you start with all this? Get into um, the old painting scene and everything else. Well, I grew up um, in, you know, in my, the time I grew up was, you know, tons of hot rod shit. I, was, I grew up in the South around bikers and stuff. Um, my mom was a biker chick. And so I was always around bikers and motorcycles. And of course, then you got cars and everything around. My dad was in the cars and stuff. And my dad was more into like the, the go buy a car. Like the, he had um, uh, um, Super B and he had a road runner and he had, he had a few, you know, a few other cars. He was definitely into muscly type cars. So I was always around hot rods and cars, motorcycles, all just the bullshit. And then of course, when I was a kid, we had cartoons, magazine, mad magazine, all the cool shit that's, I guess it's still around. I don't even, I haven't seen it in forever. And, um, you know, like all the easy rider and all the cool shit like that. And so it just got ingrained into my brain and then rat finks and all that stuff came out when I was a kid, I had all the kiss albums and like all the queen albums and all the stuff that had real cool artwork on it. And, um, my mom was real cool. She was, uh, like I said, she was just a hippie biker chick. So she was super into anything that was just different. So she would take me to the record store and just let me pick out, excuse me, pick out a record just by the, the art on the cover. So yeah. that was always cool. And then, you know, skateboarding and all that shit kind of um, sort of matured during my childhood. And so we got all the skateboard graphics that came around when I was a teenager and stuff. And so just fully influenced by just an enormous amount of cultural shift from sort of corporate America style to like the crazy shit that we know now. I was kind of in that transitional generation, which – I mean, if you didn't come out of that slightly crazy, then you weren't paying, you weren't even there. Like you, something was wrong. You so life, if you, if you didn't come out a little crazy. Yeah. Like and so I just basically, I was kind of born this way. Like I literally have never done anything but art. Like everything I've ever gotten in my life was from art. I mean, I had a couple of jobs, you know, as a teenager and shit, of course, but every girlfriend I ever got, every cool thing I ever bought, everything I've ever done was done with art. You know, like if I was, when I was a kid in school, if I liked you, which I would have definitely liked Chuck, pretty as he is, I would have just, I would have asked some, I would have asked around or paid attention to your trapper keeper or whatever you had. I guess that was later, but, and found out what your favorite cartoon character was. And I would have drawn some bubble letters with your favorite cartoon character and your name and put it on your locker. 
like literally, dude, I've been trading art for everybody. <laughs> and then um, in the late eighties, I started, or the mid eighties, I started airbrushing in my dad's garage. And then um, uh, in 1988, I actually just walked into a, a mall in the, te- the local mall in my town in Monroe, Louisiana. Um, and there's a dude airbrushing on one of these little carts, like in the middle. Yeah. And, and being my normal cocky ass self, I just walked up behind him and I was, and there's a crowd of people. It's a Saturday in a mall back in the eighties, dude, the mall was the jam. And yep. so I just walked up and I was standing there. I said, I can do that. And he turns around and he's like, yo, you think so? I was like, yeah, I can do it just as good as you can. I couldn't, but I, I thought I could. And so he, I remember it was this little pink koozie, like the little Velcro koozie. And he, he, un, he had painted a beach scene on it. He t- untaped it moved it up, taped another one right below it and said, here you go. And of course there's like 30 people standing around in the mall and they're all like, yeah, dude, go. And I painted the shittiest version and turned around like I was the baddest motherfucker on earth. And he was like, come see me tomorrow. We'll talk about getting you a job. <laughs> and then, uh, so I went the next day, little did I know at the time he was, he was a drunk. And, um, so I show up and there's this girl there and I'm like, Hey, uh, the dude, she's like, Curtis, I see. Yeah, Curtis told me to come here and for you to show me how to work the register and stuff. And um, I'm going to be working here now. And so she showed me everything and left. And then the owner calls that night, the, his mom, the guy who was running the shop, and cursing me out, telling me I robbed them and stole all their money and everything. And I was like, no, I have it in my car because the chick that showed me how to use the register said Curtis would steal it all and go get drunk. <laughs> so I basically hired myself into my first job. And then I've been that I've been a professional artist ever since. <laughs> I was the airbrusher guy for like, geez, like forever, man, in the mall. That's a hell of an origin story. <laughs> I didn't know, as long as I've known you, I didn't know you you could airbrush. Dude, I was, I was an airbrusher for like the first, I don't know. I still airbrush. I mean, but I was airbrushing like the mall guy. I was the guy you came and got like your girlfriend's name and the teddy bear and the beach scenes and all that shit for like 15 on a years. Or something or like yeah. on posters and stuff. Okay. T-shirts, license plates, denim jackets, like anything you wanted. Like you oh, just, yeah. yeah, I was just that guy. <laughs> So I was, and so I, I really attribute that to the way that I work with color, the sort of the speed at which I work. Like most people who work with me say that I'm, I work really fast, but it's yeah. not like a competition. It's just the way that it, I do things. I just do it in a, in a orderly fashion um, and use, you know, economically with my time because that's what I had to do for like the first 15 years of my career or something. Yeah. And then it made me be able to draw any fucking thing. Like, because back then we didn't have internet or any of that shit. So someone come in and just start rattling off what they want. And I would just sit there with the bag because we would take orders on the side of these white paper bags. And yeah. I would just sketch it as they were talking. And I'd be like, is that what you're talking about? They're like, uh, yeah. I'd be like, cool. Come back 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, so I just, I, you know, what they say, trial by fire, you know? I think, you know, I can actually notice now that I think about it, like looking at your art and everything seeing the your know, color palettes kind of being like that old school airbrushing style and everything, the way you kind of do that. I've never seen you work, but I'm assuming you're fast if you say you are. Well, like, and I don't, I don't know that I would say I'm fast necessarily. I just do things in an efficient way. Yeah. So it appears to be fast. And I guess I do process things uh, quickly. I'm kind of a very hyper person anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm in my mid fifties and I'm like, I wake up like a crazy five-year-old every day, you know? <laughs> Like, and I'm, I still don't sleep that much. I'm just, I don't know, probably I have some kind of ADHD or something, but I've never been like, no one ever tested me. So I never got any pills for it. So thank goodness. Cause that might've fucked me up. <laughs> you know, I might be boring if I, if I got some pills, who knows? So, but. Well, when I first saw you started really following you, you were doing a lot of the skulls and, and that stuff and everything. Well, how, how'd you go from like airbrushing to hot rods, to skulls, to, you know, doing show posters and everything else you've done. Well, when I was a kid, um, I say a kid, a teenager and even younger, I would copy the Kiss album covers. And then when Iron Maiden came out and Dio came out, all that kind of metal came out, I would copy those. And so most of my old drawings were like copying um, uh, Derek Riggs, like Iron Maiden covers and shit. Like, you know, most of our the people our age are really familiar with that stuff. And so I kind of used that as a, a jump off point. I didn't trace it. I would just try to copy it. You know, I'd lay it here and I would copy it. And um, so obviously being a metal kid back in those days, you know, there was all the skulls and all the rock and roll shit. And then when I started airbrushing, um, <laughs> village people. Yeah, dude, I liked the village people when I was a kid. I had the giant poster on my wall where they were all standing in front of a tractor or something. I remember it was just because it was again, it was just if it was a cool album, I wanted to get it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then 
as soon as I started airbrushing, I mean, dude, I mean, like the first week I was airbrushing. Hey, man, can you paint that on a tailgate? Sure. I'm, I always say yes, even if I have no fucking clue, because it's easier to figure out how to do it on someone else's dime than to take time out of making money to figure out how to do some shit. You know what I mean? Like if I'm going to learn something and you're willing to pay me to learn, let's go. Yeah. You know? And so I just, it was a natural tran- transition. And then I moved down to new Orleans. Um, and um, just a few years after that, I moved down to new Orleans. And of course they had a, a much larger car scene and all that kind of stuff. And at the time it was more like, um, like the hip hop guys down in new Orleans, like uh, master P and all those guys that, that all that was happening at that time. So yeah. I ended up painting a lot of their cars. Like I would do fake wood grain. I would do uh, like all this stuff. And it was before people were doing these like cereal box cars is what I call them, where they make it look like it's a Tony, the tiger sponsor. And I would do a lot of, um, like I said, wood grain pinstriping and some murals. Like I would paint um, chicks and paint like, um, you know, whatever their album cover, like big tanks and stuff. And then they had all these big speaker systems in their car. And so they would, at the time it was like a, it was a weird time and every, all those big speaker boxes, they were making the fronts out of plexiglass and stuff and putting lights in them and stuff. I don't know if they still do all that shit, but I would paint. You know, like early nineties or something. Yeah. Like 92, 94 ish kind of time. And I was also working um, as a sign painter with this guy called Cal custom graphics by Cal or something like that mm. um, back in those days. And um, I ended up painting this um, kicker car audio, the kicker speakers. I ended up painting the, the world championship van because he got the job and we got a lot of exposure because of that. So then of course more cars came in and then more hot rod guys started looking at like doing murals on, it was kind of a weird time whenever hot rods and low riders and hip hop and everything was kind of more mashed together. It was kind of before rat rod sort of culture and all that stuff really kind of jumped off or at least in my world it was Um, when people still wanted flashy, like brightly painted, lots of stripes, you know, almost, low rottery style, but more like Southern um, low rider, like kind of redneck low rider kind of style. Yeah. stuff. And then, you know, and then I would do classic cars cause I got really, I created a way of making wood grain that was really authentic looking. Um, and at the time, most people were just sort of airbrushing in wood grain. So it looked like fake wood grain. Um, and I actually stumbled onto it um, by accident. One day I was painting and I had, I did something. I don't remember what I did. I guess I had a run or something. I just picked up the first thing I had, which was a really crusty old towel um, and not crusty for the reasons you're thinking. Um, and I used it to wipe it off. And when I did, it made really sort of uniform scratches. And I was like, yeah. holy shit, dude, if there's anything in art, accidental greatness is the key to making good art. Yeah. If you, you plan everything, you're probably boring as shit. If you're not letting like the universe kind of like, kick you in the balls and make you sort of mess up and then go from there. So basically I took that and then just sort of uh, elaborated on that with different types of um, like um, I ended up using um, wallpaper glue brushes and things like that. that had a lot of real thick texture and they were real big and I could do cool stuff. And then I started mixing in metallics into the uh, like really light, more like pearlescence into the, the candies when I was making the wood grain Cause yeah. if you ever look at old wood furniture in the sunlight, it almost has like little sparkles in it Yeah, in a way. And someone told me that that is like sugars in the wood, like a uh, sap, I guess you call it. And, um, and you so got it, I tell you, I got a mid-century yeah. model table. I'm looking down. I'm like, yeah, it does kind of look like and it's so, got like, like a flake or something in it. Yeah. Like little pearlescent dust. Yeah. And so I started doing all that and I got really, um, <laughs> a pretty good reputation because I was doing something just not anything new. I'm sure there was someone else doing it, but where I was at and we didn't have the internet, so we didn't know what each other were doing. I thought I was the fucking greatest guy in the world in pink and wood grain. (laughs) And, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, man, just, um, what kind of cars were you doing the wood grain on? Just because I know you said low riders. Were you doing like vans and yes, I know like, I I know like the mid nineties was a weird time for, Custom it was cars and hot rods and vans and stuff. So, well, the one I kind of discovered that on um, was a 
I think it was a 74 Camaro this guy was building. And I think it was 74, somewhere at one of the earlier Camaros. Yeah. And it had wood, it had originally had wood grain on the, the shifter, the console and across the dash and stuff. And I, and he wanted it reproduced because that was basically, I guess, was a sticker or something at the time. I don't remember. Yeah, it was a decal I, or whatever. I just got it as, as primed pieces. And then so I re, sort of reproduced all the pieces with wood grain. And then that got me a job doing this really beautiful old Plymouth. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but it was, it was an old, like maybe a thirties or late thirties, early forties Plymouth. If I remember correctly, I mean, dude, it's been like 30 years. I'm I can't even believe I remember this much. And, <laughs> um, and I did this and it was a really elaborate thing with all the door jam. I mean, all the, uh, the window edges and everything. Cause those cars had tons of wood, yeah. um, or tons of sort of fake wood, I guess. Um, and, or, you know what I mean? It was painted, but it wasn't, it wasn't very good. Decals whatever it was. Yeah. I don't know if they used decals that old, that long ago or what they did, but I just remember it was a really old guy and he was restoring this car and that job somehow really was the one that I figured it out. Cause I had to figure out how to do joints where the wood would have joined together, you know, in real world wood. And then I ended up doing a couple of woodies and some other things that were, um, you know, fake woodies of course, cause there was metal at the time, but um, I don't know. So weirdly enough, being good at airbrushing and figuring out how to make wood grain was a natural transition. And then working with Cal doing the sign painting and lettering and doing like 18 wheelers and funny cars, doing like the faux grills and faux headlights and all that stuff, you know, and tail lights. And so they looked you know, all of that's airbrushed on anyway. Yes. Some of it's yes. hand painted and then you airbrush and the, yes. make it look like the lights are on or that whatever. Yes. It be. Yep. Yeah. All the turn signals and all the little reflective bits and all that. And then we would letter them and stuff. And so I started learning about outlining things, not necessarily pinstriping, but outlining. So basically we would get pinstripers, just the regular touch up brushes and just butcher the shit out of them. Um, I don't know if you can hear Can you hear that cat yowing? We are fostering, no. we're fostering a cat. It's like in the garage right there. So it's like, and she's real sweet. Uh, so people found her like on a, at a rest stop and brought them because my wife is in this network of people who, uh watch after critters but anyway so now she's on the podcast um but um oh, what was i just about to say oh so i was working on how to do the all the joints and stuff and i don't know i don't i think i just lost my train of thought sorry <laughs> <laughs> Dude, i'm like <laughs> up paint brushes so we can oh yeah we'll yeah yeah so we'll make a transition to butchering up paint brushes yes. and you can talk about how you got into making paint brushes as well oh yeah that's that's so, true so the guy I was learning from didn't know how to pinstripe, but yeah. he called himself a pinstriper. And what he would do is he would chop down a pinstriping brush. Cause if you think about a pinstriping brush, it's called a dagger stroke, you know, brush because it looks like a knife. It's straight on the top. And it's got a nice curved belly under the bottom, a long point. And he would just chop the whole belly out and just leave just the top, like 20 little hairs that are just long. And he would just use it to outline stuff with. And, um, and so that's what I thought was outlining and pinstriping and stuff. So I, I didn't know any better because I'm learning from this dude. And um, and so one day I just, before we chopped up a brush, I was like, well, I'm going to just try it like this. And when I did, I was like, dude, this is way fucking better than that bullshit you got me doing to these brushes. And um, so that was kind of my time when I, I stopped destroying brushes and started looking at what it is that made the brush work. So I was like, okay, he was having to alter the brush to fit him what do I need to do to fit to work within the parameters of like a standardized brush? Like why are the brushes made this way? Like he's one person, he can't be the, the standard. You know what I mean? Like if you, the consensus is it should be shaped like a knife blade. Well, it probably fucking works better shaped like a knife blade. So let's stop butchering the fucking things and figure out why we're the idiots that can't work with what is the standard piece of equipment. Yeah. And so that sent me into this long journey of wanting to learn more about paint brushes. And, um, I remember thinking that I wanted to go and get some lettering brushes and we had been ordering stuff from Langnickel, um, which was a company back in the day. I don't know if they're still around, but it was, it was all these lettering quills and off squirrel hair and stuff. Really nice stuff. Um, of course now I, I use all the Mac stuff and I have been now for like 20 years, but um, at the time we didn't really have much as far as like just regular feral brushes. These were all quills. Like it had a, 
it, the quill is the one that looks like it has like a, some hair stuck into the end and it has like a little piece of wire on it and you can kind of yeah. see through it because it's made with a quill, like an actual little, that plastic looking thing is actually a quill. Um, or at least traditionally it was. And maybe they're, now they're plastic, I don't know. Um, and so I went to the art store to just get some other kinds of brushes. I was like, I want to go somewhere other than the automotive, like other than the paint store, like where we would go and get, go pick up our one shot and go pick up all of our, like back in the day, I was using DuPont, um, all the chroma system stuff for painting cars and everything. Yeah. And um, a little bit of, I, I don't remember if PPG was out exactly then, but we would use all these different brands and it all came from the, the, the paint shop, right? So I went to this art store and I walked in and, and, you know, of course the normal, Hey, can I help you? And I was like, yeah, I want to get some paintbrushes. And um, I just happened to get the most douchebag motherfucker that could have possibly been there that day. Thank goodness. I'm glad it wasn't a nice person. Cause I might not have ever created my own brushes. And this guy was such a dick and he was just like, well, what do you want? And I said, actually, I don't know anything about paintbrushes. He goes, well, then why are you in here or something along those lines? And I was like, um, I'm coming to get some so I can learn about it. He's like, well, if you don't know what you want, I'm probably not going to be able to help you. And he said, do you know anything about painting? And I said, actually, I'm a professional painter. I'm a professional artist, but I've just been working in this particular field. And we have a very limited number of things that tools that we work with. And I'm trying to expand that. And he said, well, do you know anything about numbers on the brushes? And I was like, yeah, it indicates size. And he says, and he basically is I don't remember what he said, but it was basically something like, well, you're not a complete idiot. So I might be able to help you. I mean, this dude was like a dick. And I was like, I'm about to fight this motherfucker right here in the art store. And he was so shitty about, he was such a pedantic, like just a pretentious asshole yeah. that I realized that if I were going to ever have my own, if I was ever going to learn anything, I was just going to have to just figure it out on my own because I couldn't, I couldn't just do that. Right. So fast forward like 10 years or, 12 maybe 15 years 10 or 15 years and i had been going and buying art store brushes butchering them turning them into brushes that i wanted that they just didn't have i wasn't butchering them to to make them do something different i was butchering them to make my own brushes like i would go buy like a really big brush like a 10 or eight or a 10 cut it down and make myself like three number three or number fours or some kind of size as far as the size goes and with brushes the smaller the number the smaller the brush effectively yeah. Um, and, um, so then I, at some point, um, I had a friend, um, Smitty, Bill Smith, who, um, owned a place called Kingpin Tattoo Supply down in Florida. And, um, I think he was in Florida. He's still in Florida actually. And, um, he was working with Mac. They had picked up a little bit of their line because a lot of tattoo guys wanted to paint. So they had a little small section with some paint brushes and stuff. And just out of the blue one, cause I'd been working with them a lot. One day, Chris fast. Um, who owns Mac brush called Smitty up and was like, Hey man, um, you wouldn't happen to have any artists that, you know, that would be interested in working with me. We want to try to introduce some more art based paint brushes, like and just kind of expand our line from just the sort of the automotive world into like a little bit more into the art world. And fortunately for me, Smitty was like, I know just this crazy fucker you need to talk to. And so Chris called me one day and was like, Hey man, I got your number from Smitty told me you were interested in making paintbrushes, said you had a whole idea about how all this shit worked. Um, if you're interested, you know, I'd like to talk to you about making a brush set. And so right on the phone, I told him, I said, well, I just needed you to know right now, I already use all your brushes. I like a, a lot of them, but I don't want to put my name on your brushes. I want to make, if we're going to do this, I want to make brand new brushes the way I want them. And yeah. he said, sure, let's do it. And it took us about a year to get the first set. And um, it did, it, it's it's done really well, um, and people was, really seem to enjoy how it. How time was this? Probably fifteen years ago, mm. something like that. Maybe like, I, actually, I should know this, but maybe like two thousand eight, two thousand seven. Okay, some somewhere in that range. Um, and I think we started then, until then. You were just taking brushes, butchering them up however you wanted them until yeah, you just, got to make your own. Yeah, to me, I would go to the brush store to buy supplies so that yeah. I could go home and make brushes basically out of those. And um, I had a very distinct set of brushes that I really liked the way they worked. But even that, I felt like I could tweak it if I had someone that could help me. And Chris came along and I mean, we got on just great. We're still great friends. We were on the phone for like an hour today talking yeah. shit and figuring out stuff. Um, so 
Um, so I just saw a question pop up. Should I be looking at those? I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even know what it was about. I don't know if that's you or Johnny or who, or if it might be a guest or something. Oh, but, Johnny was throwing in there something. I, there I saw it and I was like, should I be reading that shit? Because it went away quick. That was a private chat to Chuck. Sometimes I give directions. So can- oh, okay. Well, we're not paying attention to you, man. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> I, so saw, I saw it pop up whenever you said something. Well, but, it goes away real fast. I can't read that fucking fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here. Well, just so he was asking if there's an actual, uh, well, now he sent something that I'm not going to I think that about. was a penis he just made over there. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he said, Is there an actual traditional, traditional pinstriping brush in all of your sets? And you oh, yeah. Point? Yeah. Um, the set. Well, again, because I like to make everything the fucking way I like it, um, I felt like there was a um, something missing in the pinstriping world, yeah. um, which sounds insane because it's everyone's literally making lines with brushes, and you can make brushes larger or smaller as long as they make a good line. Like, what's to change? And that's kind of the consensus is everyone's like, well, why reinvent the wheel? Well, what I realized is that the traditional shape that has the straight top and the, the long curve to the long belly, right? Um, oh, that thanks, Hot Rod Jen. <laughs> I don't even know what Chris has in there, actually. I haven't been to the new shop since they moved. I think they moved across the street, bought a new building or something a couple, a couple years ago. I haven't even been up there since then. But um, so in my mind, because when you're using a pinstriping brush, you're really using – and, and Everyone can be mad if I say this wrong. Everyone's got opinions. But basically, the way it's standing up, you're really only using sort of the bottom, like, say, from the point onto the curve, just like maybe half an inch or three quarters of an inch if you're really laying down a thick line or something. So you're not really using a lot of that belly. And that's really like your gas tank. Think of it that way. It's like you fill up that brush with paint, and it just, as you're bending it, it sort of feeds it, sort of squeezes it down to the tip to where it flows off right which we we had talked about previously about how the the way the hairs release the paint um and um so i thought well if you have a just a little bit overall longer brush and the belly is moved way out towards the end where you're really using that instead of it being the belly think of it like the the curve of the wheel like the the part that you have laying on the the contact patch right um if the hairs are long enough, they should feed that contact patch about as well as a belly, but you don't have those shorter hairs up towards the end, which can get squirrely sometimes. If you're really digging in and you've got to pull a long line, yeah. I find oftentimes you kind of, you start dropping the brush down to kind of get that last drop out of there, you know? And um, I found that some of those shorter hairs will get a little bit, you know, out of control or they'll get, I don't know, it, it just kind of bugged me and I finger palette. So Again, you know, another issue, I guess, with the way the brushes work. So I asked Chris if we could make a brush that has a very small curve on the end, almost like a katana. Think about the way a katana blade is, how it's long and straight, and it has that point on the end, right? Well, kind of like that, but more rounded um, instead of like the traditional dagger shape. And um, people really seem to like it, um, especially if you do a lot of curvy stuff, which doesn't really seem to make sense. Because if you think about like the King brushes, they're amazing for like all sorts of curves and stuff. And they're really small. I mean, he, I think he gets to like, what, like fucking 900 odd brushes or something. It's got like a half of a hair on it. Like yeah. they're, he has like a crazy range of brushes and I like them, but I wanted something that did something the way I wanted it to do. And obviously he created those because that's the way he paints. They have pretty short hairs. And I was like, I'm going to go the opposite way because I think it'll work. Kind of yeah. like the same way a long wheelbase car is a lot smoother than a short wheelbase car. Yep. If you've ever driven a regular Jeep, it's like driving a guy. It's like the movie driving, you know, where you're doing this the whole time. But if you get in a Cadillac, do you just fucking point it one direction? You can let go of the steering wheel. <laughs> it's going to stay there, right? The so, difference between a Jeep and a Jeepster with a yeah. Jeep longer wheelbase, it rides so much better than Jeep. totally different. And yeah. so that's I kind of took that and elaborated, kind of went from there and was like, okay, if I do this with a brush, we really only use sort of that end anyway. Yeah. How can we do this? And so after about four or five, it didn't take as many concept pieces or, or uh, sort of, I don't know, um, test piece, test brushes as I thought. 
we came up with this thing that ended up being like a, just a long, almost straight brush with just like a little bit of a curve right at the end. And um, as soon as it came out, I got so many people who were like, dude, I had no, I, this is exactly what I was, I was missing from my arsenal of brushes. Well, yeah. it does this thing really well for me. And surprisingly it does curves and stuff really well. Um, and I don't know if it's just because the contact patch ends up being a little bit smaller. You hold it a little bit higher up when you're painting with it, you know? Um, and so you can really like rock it in. If you just like anchor your fingers, you can just rock it around the inside of a flame lip or something like that. Yeah. Totally different than you would think from this super long ass brush. Is it easier? So, is it, is it all right when you like roll it? Cause I know like we talked about this before you like roll your brushes a lot. Does that work well that way too? I don't find that I roll the, the striping brushes quite as much as like lettering brushes and stuff, but yes, there, there is some twisting of the brush and stuff. And so that's why the handles from my brushes have been different than the normal broom handle that come on like the regular max. Yeah. Um, I used the handle that had a really pointy end and it had a sort of a fat top and it had a super tapered little bitty waist right before the paddle. Yeah. And the paddle is the flat spot where the, br the brushes are, are wrapped onto. Yeah. Um, and so it had a really tiny little waist because I don't have very big hands. And for that finesse, you know, so you can really rotate it a little bit easier and move it around easier in your fingers. And um, it seemed to work. And so we've stuck with that. And so that's where I kind of keep my pinstriping brushes to differentiate those from everyone else's um, because they, they are unusual in the hair configuration. Um, the traditional brushes stick to a pretty solid um, format. And then some of the other brushes, like I said, like the Kings and then some of the others, you know, kind of go the other way from what I'm doing. And they have just as many million uses as mine do, but just the other side. And so I think that it's always good to have a variety of, of tools because you'll find ways to use tools that aren't even built into the, the idea of the original or the origin of the tool itself. Like I yeah. find that, and that's why none of my brushes have numbers on them. None of them have traditional names like filberts or any of that or, or rounds or any of that. I give them stupid ass names because unlike the guy at the art store, I didn't want people to feel like they were obligated to use this brush in a particular way more that I wanted them to be able to get the brush and experience it and figure out what they do with it. So yeah. when people ask me, dude, what do you do with say like you, you know, your whichever brush particular, the mullet or whatever. And I'm like, well, I'll show you what I do, but that doesn't mean that that's what it's, that's the only thing it does. So how about you figure out how it works for you first and then we'll compare notes. Yeah. So, like, I was about to ask, I figured Johnny pop it up. I was about to ask like, Hey, what do you use all these brushes for? But you know, or what would you recommend it to be used for? But like you said, everybody well, has their own way of using them. Here's a great, this is a great photo. I don't know where Johnny found it, but thanks Johnny. Um, if you look at these brushes and you think about a traditional paintbrush, most traditional paintbrushes start at the ferrule at a point, right? Or yeah. we'll say that in general. And they, they're kind of like a small taper back to the other end, which usually ends up being about the same size as the ferrule end, right? Yeah. So it's, they're not really straight, totally straight necessarily, but they don't have a lot of curves to them. Well, if you look at these and you look at, say, the top one, the slim, it's a really small brush. I, I don't know what the numbers would be on it, maybe like a one or a three, maybe at the most, maybe a one or two. But if you look at the belly on that brush, they almost look exaggerated. And it's because I like a really small ferrule down at the bottom, or I call it a waist, the right where the ferrule comes on, because it almost looks like it's belted. That's why I call it a waist. I don't know what the technical terms are. But Chris and I kind of have our own language for making brushes because I came in, I wasn't very knowledgeable about the industry, you know, um, labeling, but I knew what I wanted. Yeah. And so he's, he's worked yeah. with me really well over that. Yeah. And, um, so if you look at these brushes and even if you go all the way to the end where the red is, you notice how it almost is, it's almost fatter than it is right where it says Tidwell at. Yeah. And I wanted that shape. I wanted it because I'm, I'm, I have small hands, but I'm real heavy handed. Like when I use a pencil, I can't use anything smaller than like a, a nine. Like I usually use a the 2.0, like a drafting pencil because I just snap leads. I, I don't know why I'm just fucking heavy handed. Um, like I'm like a miniature caveman. I don't know. So I would find myself breaking brushes right about where it says Mac Tidwell all the time. And so all my brushes were taped together and stuff. And Chris was like, we can make that handle whatever shape you want. So we ended up 
adding this fat little belly on it so that you have something to get, like when you have your fingers on the end, that belly sort of fills in that space in between your fingers. So it makes it a lot easier to hold on to. You don't find yourself dropping brushes as much. Um, if you paint very much, dropping brushes is just part of the fucking game. Like just the way it works. Like I've had to clean up more shit from dropping brushes than ever from just bad painting. Yeah. Um, and so I would always break brushes. So I told Chris, I said, I want him to be fat out on the end. And he was afraid it might affect the weight or the balance of the brush. And I was like, well, you're fucking holding on to the other end. If your hand's not heavier than a little bit of extra paintbrush, you probably need to eat a goddamn cheeseburger. You know what I mean? Like fucking put a ring on or something, like weight your hand down. And so we, we had a laugh and it turns out that a lot of other people who were a bunch of fucking cavemen, just like me, wanted thicker handles that they could, you know, abuse a little bit more, but then have that tiny little end. So it was real easy to manipulate. Um, so again, like I didn't, we came at it starting from his point of view. So he had a, a reference point. And so a lot of the, the first brushes were built off of the, the, I say built off, they sort of followed in line with the, the evolution of the Mac virus brushes that yeah. had real skinny little handles. Um, but the, the, the brightness and the spring and stuff and the, and the release on the viruses was pretty damn good. But even that I wanted to change. Um, and here you can put up if Johnny, if you don't mind, if you want to put up one of the sets of brushes, like either the pink ones or the first green ones you put up. Uh, not those. And I, I can explain why in a second. But if you look at these brushes, if you look yeah. at the hairs on them, the hairs vary in color depending on the brush. And what that is, is we use different types of synthetic hairs depending on how bright or how um, springy I wanted them or how limp I wanted them to be. And also the way that paint flows off of them, because there's a, I, I believe the term is it's a capillary effect with natural hair brushes because they're kind of like a pine cone if you look at them under a microscope, right? Mm -hmm. And what that does, it creates like microscopic suction that kind of holds the paint and lets it flow off in an even sort of speed. And synthetic brushes suffered in that regard because it was sort of like a linear release. It just sort of let the paint go. Yeah. You, you would be painting and it would just stay up towards the ferrule and it would never flow down properly. So in order to combat that issue with synthetic brushes using fluid materials, I needed a way to control the flow and the sort of the springiness and, and all of that of the brush. So we started combining different types of synthetic hairs. Some, for instance, some of the brushes have like firmer hairs in the middle and then softer hairs around the edge. So that it's still springy, but it releases the paint in an orderly fashion or a controllable fashion. Um, and then some of them I, I used um, denser hairs because I wanted them to be a little bit stiffer. So you could use them for things like texture and, and dry brush techniques and things like that. So it's really, it's really fun and really cool. Um, like for instance, if you look here at the, the fourth one down the flat top, yeah. notice how it's darker out towards the edge, towards the end, it should be lighter because it's actually thinner out there. But what that is, is the, I, I, some people call them guard hairs, I guess. Um, some people have referred it to that as me as guard hairs. But if you notice down towards the ferrule end, they're lighter. And what that is, is it's, it creates more of a, an absorbent, not absorbent because it doesn't actually absorb, but it kind of holds the paint a little bit better. And then it flows off of the darker color hair a little bit different speed. So effectively, I've created a brush that has two functions from the ferrule to the tip in that it controls the paint flow, but it also has the, the amount of um, resistance to the hand that I wanted in order for it to work correctly to be a functional brush and not just be like a limp noodle or just like a hog hair, hard bristle brush. So many, there's a, a lot a that goes into these things, man. <laughs> oh yeah. That's what I was going to say. Like how many different sets of brushes have you made at this point now? Cause I mean, well, I think we've kind of talked about this before you were talking earlier. I could take, you know, a year basically to come end up with a brush, right? Well, to do a set, usually what I do is I start out with what I found is missing from the last set I made. Yeah. Because when I make a new set of brushes or Sarah and I've actually worked on the last two together because Sarah, my wife, is an amazing artist. Um, she's yeah. actually probably the, the real talent in the family, but I'm not going to tell anybody because I, yeah. like, I like being on podcasts and shit. So, <laughs> But uh, no, she has an, an, an enormous wealth of painting um, skill. Like she really has a lot of time behind the brushes. And so once we were, you know, really working together a lot, um, 
and ironically, we worked together for a long time before we were a couple, but she was my body paint model. I would do these bottle body painting events and I would, you know, who, you got to have like a, a beautiful naked girl to paint. So she was my body paint model for years. And um, so, and she was also a painter. So if I couldn't make it to an event, she would go and body paint the naked women and take the event. So we worked together in that aspect. But then once we started working together more in an illustrative fashion, where we would sit down and work on drawings and paintings and stuff together, I started realizing that her brush knowledge was all of the things that were missing from mine. And all of my brush knowledge were the things that were missing from hers. So yeah. we started thinking about making sets together. And the first set we made were the monster sticks, which are the purple, the green and purple ones. Um, and by that time I'd already made this set that's up now, which is the original six piece set. Then I made a three piece set that filled in some of these. And then I made the pinkies, the broken pinkies, which are the pink handle ones. Yeah. And they sort of fill in again. So if you take the pinkies and the first two green and red sets, it's really like one big set of brushes. And oh. then um, in a way, like it, it's kind of a continued set. And then um, the monster sticks are the first ones that Sarah and I worked on together, which are the green and purple ones. And if you notice in there, you've got some stubby ones and some more traditional art looking brushes. Yeah. But even those we changed quite drastically from the norm. Like if you look at, for instance, the top one, the better half, basically just the reason it's called that, it's just basically it's a half inch wide brush, yeah. but it's, it's, um, um, I believe it's called a, uh, oh shit. I think it's called a filbert. No, that's the, I don't even remember actually at this point, <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, wait, 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 I, it's called an Egbert. I believe it's long oh. with the rounded tip. And I think the oh. filbert is the more blunt tip. Maybe I see, I still don't even know. I've been doing this shit for ever. It, I still know. Make these brushes, is it hard to, you know, please artists that use enamel paint versus using acrylics? No. So the same difference or. So all of the brush sets that I have um, until this one, until the monster sticks and the, the, um, the foxtails, which are the orange ones. These are the two latest sets. Yeah. They have some much closer to traditional brushes than my other sets have. My other brushes have been tr uh, aimed directly towards liquid paints, like one shot um, fluid acrylics and things that are real flowy type paints. Yeah. There's not a lot of body to them. They're sort of like really liquid, but still have a lot of opacity. Um, and um, so Sarah had been, had come from the more traditional, like the heavier body paints. So she was used to having a sort of smear paint around instead of pulling it around. Right. Yeah. And so she started learning about fluid paints and I started learning about heavy body paints. And um, I didn't really like the heavy body paints very much because I'd spent so much time as an illustrator doing all these, the way that I blend and everything and just kind of was catered to the medium I was in. Right. As yeah. we all do, you, yeah. you find your place within the medium you choose. And um, so we started trying to split the difference. So I started looking at her traditional brushes, which are like this more short square or stubbier kind of type of brushes and I thought, well, how can I make these work with fluid type paints or li more liquid type paints? So let's take, for instance, the better half at the top. That is a um, based off of a traditional brush shape. But again, if you look at the hairs, you'll see the different colors in the hairs. And what it is, is it's super, super thin. Like a traditional brush like this is, is pretty thick from front to back or, you know, yeah. not, not width, but like actual thickness. Yeah, so it was like a side or something you'd see yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. So it's meant to really hold a lot of heavier body type paint. Well, those don't flow off very well because there's too much there. You know what I mean? So we basically flattened it out, put really soft hairs on the edges and like a little bit firmer hairs in the middle. So then it works more like a sign painter or like a, an illustrator type brush, mm. but it has a little bit more shape, a little bit more traditional shape that people would be familiar with from a sort of more of a fine art category. So basically it just gave people who work in the fine art category an opportunity to recognize something and give it a try and bring in sort of cross pollinate from the automotive and illustration world into the more traditional paint world. And it's been really well received because again, I'm not reinventing the wheel so much as just putting different, different types of tires and different types of wheels together, you know, yeah. basically, and then making slight tweaks, you know? Um, and you're so, some brushes is what you're doing and, and people can use those brushes, how, 
whenever they need to or how they feel like they can use them, basically. Yeah. And I mean, think about it with tools. Like, for instance, say, you know, you've got a, I don't know, like, say you've got a a, a 10 inch crescent and a four inch crescent, you know, like the your two opposite ends of the spectrum. And someone comes along and goes, fuck, man, I need a That's six okay. inch crescent, dude. I just need a, I just need something in between these fucking sizes. Yeah. But that was me. And so that's what I did with paintbrushes. I just came in and sort of tried to fill in gaps that I, that I thought from my perspective as an artist and from Sarah's perspective as an artist, she did the same. We saw things that we kind of wish existed. And then we just tried to fill that, those gaps and then add our own little bit of a stank on it, if you will. And um, people have been very receptive and people have um, um, credited these brushes with helping them change their style or grow in a different direction where they were struggling before they're like, fuck, I didn't realize it wasn't just me. It was the tools. I, I was missing something. Yeah. And, and I'm a real big believer in that tools don't make the art. It's the hand. But if the hand has the correct tool, it can really re- make the art. You know what I mean? So anyway, sorry, I sound like some fucking, yeah. some, hey, you're, you know, you're, you're passionate about those, those brushes and everything you know so it's one of those things it's how we get our ideas onto the surface yeah like without it without the the tools like it's just if you have an idea and a surface and you don't have any tools to get it there man that's a really that's a shitty position to to be in you know yeah so i just want to provide more tools and and literally i'm just making the brushes i wanted (laughs) and all those sets you got a couple of sets right now available on your website right like five different sets. Yeah. I think I have the, the two green sets, which is the six piece, the three piece, yeah. got the broken pinkies, the monster sticks, the um, foxtails. And then I have my hippie triple, which is the, the latest version of my pinstriper. And I want to just say this, I don't want people to not buy them because of this, but the, just to be warned that um, there was an issue manufacturing that the particular pinstriping handle that I like, the one that's got the tiny waist and the fat end and the little point yeah. on the end. So the latest batch of hippie triples have the traditional Mac broom handle handle. Yeah. So if you're like me and you've become obsessed with that different shape handle, we're trying to get them manufactured again. But um, I think it's okay for me to say this. If not, Chris can just be mad. The, <laughs> the really tapered handles we were made in um overseas i don't know i don't i don't want to say china because i'm not sure if that's where they were they were overseas and he was trying to get the manufacturing here in america because just supply chain issues and just he just felt like it was worth the extra couple of cents for per handle because he just felt like we're an american company we pride ourselves in making everything here in-house by hand and i'm outsourcing this particular thing just because of this particular shape that this asshole tidwell wants and I didn't know this. I just thought it was a handle because he had used it in the past. Yeah. Um, and so he moved everything back here. And when he did, that handle hasn't been available. But he said that he's actually working on with a couple of people trying to get that handle made again. So yeah. hopefully the next batches will come out with the, the normal handles that I like. But if you're a striper, it's not a huge difference between the two handles. Like if you're already used to painting with it, I can paint with just about anything you hand me. You just hand me yeah. like a a squirrel itself and I could figure out how to paint with him as long as he's not biting me. Um, well, I could probably figure that out, but it's just a matter of like, if you're going to make something specifically a, one specific way, you know, you want to kind of keep making it that specific way, because what's going to happen is you're going to get people who build a style or build a particular technique off of that exact handle. And I hate taking that away just because of a supply chain issue. So um, we're trying to get that handle made again. Yeah, uh, here in the states. Hopefully you, that, hopefully, you get that done soon here in the states, and you know, get back to yeah, make things in America and everything. And then, yeah. a question for you: If I yeah. remember right, you just published your nineteenth book. Yes, um, and um, it's just full of dumb shit. Like it's so it's super fun. So it, like covers, all your- it covers an enormous amount of it's it's an enormous variety of styles. Yeah. Um, I try to use, when I'm making a book, I usually try to kind of, I don't know. I kind of like to, I don't know what you call it, narrate it. I mean, not narrate it. Uh, what's it called? Um, well, you had series. You had like, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah. 
my brain is not working. I'm still thinking about paintbrushes. Um, but I try to sort of make it a subject, you know, kind of yeah. sort of make like a skulls book or make a book of, yeah. you know, of whatever trees or whatever thing. And so I've been sort of experimenting with making a little bit more of a variety type book. And this book, I went all the fuck out. Like I got everything from like traditional, like old school hot rod stuff all the way through to like modern art looking stuff. I mean, to graffiti stuff like it is and it's called Random Thoughts. And it's yeah. and it's literally that because it is just whatever the fuck came out of my head over the last little time while I was making it. Oh, OK. So this is all new art, though. It's nothing from the past. So you've there are a few pieces that art. sorry, there are a few pieces that I realized hadn't been published in like that. I hadn't put out in their full color version because yeah. I make these little coloring book type books yep. that are just line art. And so some of them have been in there, but in here they're fully realized, like they're fully elaborate, um, all colored, you know, fully inked out and drawn. Everything's fully done. And it was just an opportunity for me to take a few drawings that, like I said, hadn't really been put in one of my books. They've maybe been in magazines or whatever. Um, but uh, thanks, man, Zach. I don't know. I don't, wait, my, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. It was really cool. Like he just made a really cool comment. I appreciate that. Yeah. And it pops uh, up, you just stop. Because I, I was, I had to read. My brain can only do like so many things. I got two brain cells, dude. It's a shout out, Zach. Yeah, no, so, yeah. Random, random thoughts is what the book's called, right? Yeah, and it yeah, literally no. is. It's, it is. Um, I've always enjoyed all your books. I, I have a few that. of them. I have a few of them from, or I got some of the skull ones and everything else. I actually have some of the coloring books too. I haven't colored any of them in because I just like to look at them. But um, I mean, 19 books is a, is a hell of an accomplishment, you know, dude, it, I appreciate that. And it's just, it just shows my obsessiveness. Like no. I, I, I wake up every day, like stoked to do this shit. Like I'm not one of those people that has to struggle for ideas. I have to struggle for the time, finding the time to get all the shit on paper. You know, no, you, I mean? you got a book just on bicycle. Cause I know, What's funny is like I've I've followed you for a long time. I mean, you've talked, you know. Yeah. I got I got the well, I guess the mother of hot rodding tattooed on me. I don't know, fifteen shit, almost twenty years ago at this point that we talked yeah. about. It's been a minute, you know. So it's like I've followed you, and it's funny because it's like you had the skulls, you had the hot rods, you had the bicycles because you, you're an avid avid uh, bicycle rider. Dude, you I'm know? obsessed. Yeah, <laughs> um, and you sent me a picture the other day of. All your bicycles, you and your uh, you and your kids' bicycles, which we got to get your your kids' uh, haircut here in a second. Dude. Uh, but what I've always also loved about what I've seen you do is all the the gig posters you do for bands, because especially since you know I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of the bands you've done for the Melvins, uh, Clutch and all that stuff, the Queens yeah. of the Stone Age, you know, and you always find a good way to incorporate not only like what that band is doing or what that band stands for, but then also your own style and your, I guess, way of life or something. I don't know. Well, I'm a fan. So I try yeah. not to do posters for bands that I don't like, you know, yeah. I've done a few for random bands that I wasn't sure. Or I didn't really know a lot about, but I like their style, you know, yeah. for instance. Um, but like I do a lot of stuff for bands that I actually like. Oh, and so, Oh, yeah, here's a ministry. That's a, that one's pretty old. That's from Oh four. Damn. That's almost 20 years, dude. Yeah, oh, 19 years almost. So, um, and then oh, like the Snoop Dogg, and I mean, I've done <laughs> stuff for like everybody, man. And it's really fun because Why? basically what I do is the same thing I do with brushes. I make the poster that I want to see from that band. Yeah. You know, and um, what's one of your favorite posters you've ever made? Um, or top three. Well, I definitely like all the clutch posters I've made. I, I think those are fun because it gives me an opportunity to use. Uh, I do love this Wu Tang poster because I just wanted to draw a big ass dragon, and I did for that poster. So, and uh, I got to go to the show and see it and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just watching him flip through these things, and it's like, yeah, I'm I am definitely a. Now, this is a poster that Sarah and I did together. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I wanted her to do a poster, and she doesn't normally draw many skulls or anything, and so we just drew this together and I just thought it was super cool. Cause she ended up drawing the skulls for this particular one. Yeah. I, think I, I think I inked them. She drew the sketch for it, but I thought it was just fun to have her skulls front and center because 
you know, I don't know. She's a badass. And like, I just like seeing her grow as an artist the same way I'm trying to grow as an artist. You guys, you guys did a book together as well, right? Uh, we did a couple of books. Um, we yeah. call them 8469 yep. um, books. And it's because she was born in 84. I was born in 69. Okay. And um, so, yeah, I started my art career. My wife was four. So you, uh, <laughs> uh, me and your wife are the same age. Okay. That's no wonder I'm so attracted to you. Yeah, well, I was going to say that's <laughs> It's the beard, man. But um, uh, no, it's fun. I love that you guys do because you guys not only you know you guys are artists. You're both artists. You know, I have a couple of pieces from both of y'all, but you also are an avid collector of other artists' art. Oh yeah. You know, I think you got what nine thousand square foot building, just art wall to ceiling, the floor, floor to ceiling, however you want to say it. Yeah. Um... We have the 9,000 square foot building that I'm sitting in now, which has the studio, our art studio in the front, like, I think, I think it's 39 feet or whatever it is, 45 feet, something like that. And then the building's 200 feet long. So back there behind those doors is where the house and all that stuff is at. And over here on this side, you can't see, I don't have any lights on. It has, um, there's a, a big shop in there. And then right next to me is a garage. Um, and, um, yeah, it's kind of like art nerd paradise. And then next door, we have a 5,800 square foot building, which houses our, our art gallery. And then I, I have a bunch of spaces that I rent out to other artists that, um, you know, that do like woodworking. One guy does woodworking, um, Jeremy Vessels, um, which is amazing. He takes skateboards and basically glues them together, all the different color layers of skateboards, cuts them up and makes them into tables and stuff. And then the guys in the front are um, a mural company, OSRS, here in, in um, the Midwest. And they are they are no bullshit. They are like amazing mural artists. They're all also artists on their own rights. Yeah. Like, teamed up. So just an amazing group of artists. And then we have our art gallery. We have our own shows and stuff. Um, it's kind so of a art commune, basically. Yeah. Art, art compound is what I call it. Yeah. And um, yeah, I have like it's a big it's a couple of like industrial buildings or something. Right. Yeah. There's big commercial buildings. Um, and then we have trucking companies on both sides of us. So we're kind of like a little island of creativity in the middle of industrial shit. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, like I said, I say this all the time, but I'm one of those stupid people who just believes whatever fucking idea pops into my head and I just go do it. Like, yeah. I don't, like if I told you I'm going to go and build a fucking, you know, whatever. And you said, I don't know about it. I'd be like, I don't care what he thinks. I'm just going to go do it. I'd rather fail trying to do it my way than just not do it because you said it probably wasn't a good idea. Yeah. And it's not even because I'm trying to prove anything. It's just because I'm just, I don't know. I, I've never really just given a shit what everyone else was doing or what everyone else was thinking about what I was doing because I figured that it's my life. I get one chance. If yeah. I'm going to fuck it up, I'm fucking it up the way I want. You know, I'm not yeah. going to just do it the way everyone else does and then be mad and blame it on other people. You know, I, I really would rather just go and do it, completely fuck everything up. And um, that's it. Just if I, if I fail, I fail. That just means I learned something. There's yeah. no real failure. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound like a, one of those <laughs> self-help posters. But if you're not fucking falling down or failing and you're fucking not doing anything, you know, yeah. you got to get out there and do shit, which brings me to a, a thought, if you don't mind, um, as, yeah. if, as if you could stop me from fucking talking all day anyway, um, <laughs> is that as a collector, and I'm, I'm going to preface this with this part, so I'll yeah. get to the point in a second. As a collector, like you pointed out, we literally have hundreds of original pieces. If yeah. there's an artist listening to this podcast, there's a chance that I have one of their paintings or something yeah. of things, right? book, poster, stickers, whatever it is. We collect anything that has to do with art. Or as I say, we put our money where our mouth is. Yeah. And um, we literally have hundreds of original pieces. And you've been seeing a lot of the collection. I've been sending you photos yep. of just walls and walls and walls of art. And um, um, so it gets getting to the point that whenever I collect art, I collect a really eclectic sort of variety of art. I have everything from like fine art paintings to French, um, literally French pinup art, you know, that's funny meme going around, paint me like a French girl, but I actually literally have paintings of like French pinup art that goes all the way back to the early forties, all the way through to things like, you know, um, a lot of graffiti art, a lot of, uh, sort of modern art 
I guess you say contemporary artist, you know, they're doing sort of the, their new version of like the modern art movement, which is like weird expressionist stuff and weird takes on, on old styles. And um, I do that because I feel personally as an artist that if I'm not evolving, then I'm going to bore my audience. I'm going to make, I'm going to get bored. And if I'm bored, it's going to show in the work and then people aren't going to be stoked on it because they're like, it just looks like you don't give a fuck anymore. Right. Yeah. So when I get introduced to an artist or I say introduced, when I I find an artist that I like a, a new artist and I start collecting their work and it stays the same for very long, maybe a year or two or more than a couple of years, I start feeling, I start just kind of easing away from them. I find myself just getting bored with them. And um, so as an artist, it bums me out whenever my fans or my collectors or people who like my stupid shit um, don't want to see me evolve because they like a particular thing that I do. And I feel that way about some artists. I'm like, man, I wish he would just make some more of these things, like play the classics, you know, like Freebird. There's always that guy that wants to hear Freebird every time. Freebird. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like I'm that guy. I'm like, man, I wish so and so would just make a couple more of those car paintings because I really want one. And not that I don't like what he's doing or she's doing, but it's like I've been waiting for one of these in my collection and now they've they've moved on, they've evolved. Yeah. As an artist, I do the exact same thing. And so one of the biggest, um, I, it's, it's definitely not a criticism of people who like my art, but one of the biggest problems I have with people who like my art or who have supported me and follow me and stuff is that as soon as I start getting experimental or trying something new, I get a lot of these DMS and stuff. They're like, Hey man, uh, you're going to paint some more flying eyeballs or some more skulls or some more hot rods. And I'm like, I will, but I was getting bored with that. And, and I almost want to say, how the hell are you not bored with it? I made like 20 of those paintings in a row. I yeah. want to do some new things. And, well, I think as, a, as an artist, probably it's a little bit easier to keep yourself motivated if you're doing something different because you're you're painting day in, day out. You're doing something. But if you, you know, for guys just seeing it, you know, I, I think just a normal guy on the street, me, I'm not an artist. Right. But if I see it's like, oh, I really like like you. I love your skulls. But I also have, you know, I have your I have a print of one of your bicycle paintings I got. So some of your tree things and everything else, you know, for some normal people, they just may really like skulls, yeah. you know, but they don't understand that for you to be motivated to continue to paint, you have to change it up every once in a while. Is that kind of what you're getting at or am I way off no, base? No, dude, that's, you said it better than I, I, I was trying to think of how to say it, but that's a really great way to say it in that I get bored. If I'm just doing the same shit, like if I'm just making widgets and what I really, one of the things that I, 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 I dislike the most that artists do. So if you're listening and you do this, you can get my address from Chug and come over here and we'll fight. I don't care. <laughs> um, is that when someone comes out and they're like, oh my God, I'm releasing a brand new thing. And it's just a different color of the last thing. It's yeah. like, I made a red one. Oh no, now I made a purple one. No, now I made a green one. It's like, motherfucker, all you're doing is changing the color. Do something new so I have something new to buy from you. Yeah. And as a collector, I feel that way. And as an artist, I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm having to drag people along with me. Like, come on, man. I know you like the hot rod shit, but you also probably had a bicycle when you were a kid. So yeah. just just stick with me for a minute. And I promise I'm going to make something that's relevant that you'll that you'll get. And it may not be exactly what you're looking for, but maybe we can evolve together. Like as, a, as an artist, as a collector. And then as a collector of my art, maybe we can all just keep evolving together because if people just keep doing the same shit, they're only going to have that thing, you know, and people are going to get bored of it. And so as an artist, I think if I didn't experiment, I would have never stumbled into the things that got your attention in the first place. So yeah. without that experimentation, I'm just going to be sitting in the same spot. And yeah. if you would have kept airbrushing 30 years ago, no one you would know me. I'm yeah. Sure. Me and you wouldn't be talking. I wouldn't have one of your pieces tattooed on me or anything like that. But I think too, like artists, some artists, it's you know, it's not that you have to change your style or what you do. You just kind of change the subject. Yeah, that, you just try different different subject matter. Maybe adjust one, your color palette and stuff. You yeah, know, like Bow Monster. Um, you know, I'm a huge Bow Monster fan. I love the guy. He's a real good dude. He does the scratch boards. There's only so much he can do with that, but his. 
he's he's good at changing up themes and everything. He did motor, he does motorcycles, he does hot rod hill, he does trains, he does desert scenes and just you know mountain scenes, and it's it's always but it's always you always know it's a bow monster, you know. But he still keeps changing up the th themes and everything. And uh, do you have any peers right now that you're watching close that are just really blowing you away with what they got going on? No, I'm the best, dude. No. <laughs> Thank I'm you. joking, dude. No, dude. I have I have a list of artists that I think are the the, the that I can't even I, like. I literally would feel embarrassed to even be their assistant. Like, yeah. you know. And I I'm definitely not one who's ever drank my own Kool Aid. Like, I've never thought I was cool. Never thought I was the best at anything. I always think I need to keep growing so that I can at least stay in the in the game. Like. Yeah, I feel like I have to earn it every day. And every time I release a new piece, I feel like I'm trying to earn the trust of people who are watching me. Yeah, like I feel like I don't want to let anybody down. And I don't mean that in a like a, a neurotic sort of way, but more just like, hey, these people are trusting me to sort of interpret the ideas they see in the world and put it on paper. And yeah. I'm doing it, you know, not that I'm necessarily filtering your ideas, but like if we're if we're both in the same culture we both are looking at things and we both think about them in a certain way you know i mean we have uh, there's a certain amount of continuity but then there's also our own individual ways of thinking and for people to watch my art and to look at what i'm doing i feel like there's a certain level of trust that i'm not going to go and fuck it up you know yeah. and so i want to earn that trust and i also don't want to bore you as a viewer i don't want to bore myself as a as a content creator um, which I actually hate that term. That makes me think about people on Instagram showing their butts. But I, you know, as a as a, a content creator in the in the the, the traditional well, grand okay. scheme, like I'm creating books of art that are yeah. literally books of content of of new new ways of looking at things. I don't think of anything I do as being very original. I just think of me putting my stank on it. You know, like everything I've ever drawn or anything. Like you can find other versions of it. Like I'm not the I'm not the guy who's inventing the new world. I'm just the guy who's putting you know a, a little bit of a twist on things that I've looked at and thought. You know what? I love Chuck's version, but is there anything I could add to the conversation visually? And so yeah. that's literally my goal is just to simply add my two cents to things because from a creative point of view, I feel like that that. I'm not the most creative guy. And this isn't self-deprecation. This is literal. Like, I really feel like I'm not the most creative guy, but I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on how to twist things up that make me smile. And maybe it makes other people smile as well. And I feel like that that's the reason my career has gone so long is being able to twist things just enough to make people continue smiling in my direction yeah. and handing me $20 bills. <laughs> you know, that, that's usually important too. So if you, anybody's got any spare twenties laying around, again, you can get my chip, my address from Chuck. <laughs> send it, send it on uh, with a no return label. Well, one of the things that you find is the the younger the artist, the bigger the ego. The yeah. older the artist, the longer term art careers, the smaller the ego. Because when I was starting out, if you asked me, I would have probably told you I was the baddest motherfucker on earth because yeah. I didn't know any better. I, yeah. I was the I was I was looking at like three other people that were around me and I'm like, I can kick all three of your asses, so I must be the baddest dude in the valley. Yeah. But then when the internet came, I realized that I was like a fart in the wind. And I was like, holy shit, I gotta really get I need to get better. And yeah. and getting better requires a lot of evolving. And um I know a lot of artists who never evolved and now they're just angry and bitter because they're no longer like the hot number. It's like, but you didn't fucking bring anything to the table. The table's yeah. moving. And I have a, a saying that I tell myself all the time, a couple, actually a lot, but these are a couple that I feel like are relevant to this conversation and that other people might be able to use, is that I heard a, a physicist say one time that the there's there's one main law that governs the entire universe, and that is that nothing ever stays the same. It's either yeah. growing or dying. And I would much rather be growing because – even if you make the same exact rat fink drawing every day and make it a different color, you're not growing. You're dying. You're, you're, you're losing interest in that every day, every time you draw it. And then the other one is when I make a new sketchbook, I usually write in there like my next thing needs to be my best thing because, and I know that's not 
a literal thing, but it's, it's an encouraging thing. It's like a thing that just reminds me that I need to keep fucking trying to do better than I did before, because if I don't, the people who have been watching me are going to know. And they're going to be like, well, Tidwell's fucking washed up. He ain't doing, he's just boring. He's boring now. And so it's important to me to see other artists grow and evolve, even if their, their viewers or their, their collectors don't necessarily get it or don't necessarily follow along. And then it becomes kind of a struggle because if you're doing really great and you're making tons of money drawing widget A in blue and you decide to go off and create a whole new widget, then and no one buys it, you feel very discouraged. And then what that does, it affects your creativity and not that pe- or your productivity as well. Not that people need to buy every fucking stupid thing I make, but understand that it's part of the process to become a better artist and to grow as an artist and to create something one day that you will not be able to live without. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I got to get there. And sometimes getting there is a messy thing. And uh, well, I, oh, go ahead. Right. You, so you do some because you do some uh, live painting and stuff as well, right? At shows and everything. Oh yeah, I do anything if it has to do with art, I do it. Yeah. So does uh, like I was kind of thinking about this while you were, while we were talking earlier too. Is like as your art changes, does that kind of change? So you know, so for instance, like if you go to a Hot Rod show right now and you're doing a live painting, are you going to revert back to painting your Hot Rod style, or are you just going to do whatever you got going on or whatever you're doing, your style or whatever? No, I, I try to, I cater to the, to the, the, the audience. Group, um, yeah, the audience. That's a great, I couldn't think of the word, but like, if I go to, if I go to say, for instance, a hot rod show, you yeah. know, I'll bring my bicycle books and I'll bring bicycle stickers and I'll bring that stuff, but I'll bring all my hot rod shit, you know, which I still love. I fucking love it. You know, it's, it's part of my blood, but I find myself, I don't know. Oh God, this is about to be controversial as saying something political. <laughs> I find that that the hot rod world and the hot rod art world and just like every other world, there are points where there's like these sort of plateaus where it'll stick for a minute. Right. And that's where I feel like it's our job as artists to kind of nudge it forward. Even if we fuck it up, at least we're doing something that shakes up the system. Yeah. And I feel like that the last few years because of COVID and everything, um, you know, there really weren't very many shows. There wasn't a lot going on. A lot of things got very stagnant. And so it's been really exciting over the last, say, 10 months since things have kind of loosened back up again to watch all the creativity that was just pent up, just exploding. And so now I'm kind of reinvigorated with the hot rod scene because yeah. for the couple of years, even a couple of years leading up to COVID, I felt like I was getting bored, you know, and that's not a reflection on any particular st- style of car building or a style of hot rod art, but it felt like everyone was kind of like had gotten to a point and just kind of was sitting there waiting for someone to sort of, you know, how they say, light the fires and kick the tires. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they were, everyone was yeah, waiting for someone else to do it. Yeah. You know? I got to agree with that. It's, you've seen a lot of the same bills over and over again. Yeah. One of my, uh, one of my buddies said one day, he's like, how many more times do I have to see the same 32 Ford and a, and a blown Willys? Yeah. You know? and and so, I was like, yeah. I don't know. And, you know, and it's like you said, COVID kind of, everybody kind of reflected, I think during COVID yeah. as artists or, builders or whatever you were doing and then once you know stuff came, like this last grand nationals there's a lot of cars there that just the styling and everything just was there's a lot more diversity i guess is kind of what i i guess i'm getting at with that there's a lot more diversity in the car scene and maybe the art scene as well from your standpoint yeah exactly and what it felt like to me was it was like a renaissance like it was kind of like this re-envisioning this thing that we had all kind of sort of poked it to death. You know what I mean? Like it was kind of like I wanted to see something new and I was struggling to figure out how to be part of that growth that I wanted to see. And like I said, I don't really consider myself to be some creative giant. I feel like I'm really good at interpreting what's happening and just kind of adding a little bit to it. Right. Well, if nothing's really happening, well, then it falls to people like me to really dig in as deep as we can and find whatever extra little bit of creativity I can draw out of my shriveled up little soul and um, try to put it out there. And in doing that, I came up with a lot of the things that you find in this, in my new book, random thoughts. And dude, I mean, when I say random, there's like, geez, there's like every fucking weird thing impossible. But that was my, 
evolution throughout COVID and all of that, because I, I really needed to keep myself interested because nothing in the world was really happening. Most people were just sitting around bitching and complaining about stuff and they weren't being productive. A lot of artists really quit being productive during that time because they were just bummed out and they didn't feel like they had a reason. Like I don't have any shows. So why would I make 10 new pieces just what? to fucking take up room in my house? Well, I was the opposite. I thought, well, when this shit pops off again, I'm going to be the guy that can fill a booth with brand new shit and nobody seen. Yeah. And so I thought of it from, from a, from a sheer product, kind of a production point of view. Like if the industry is having a, sort of a downtime. Well, when everyone comes up, it's going to take everyone a moment to get back online. Right. Well, right. I'm going to be the motherfucker that was already online, just waiting, like just sitting there, just like, come on, open the door. You know what I mean? And so that's what this random thoughts book is, is it's, it's, it's really a collection of that. And there are quite a number of drawings in here that are go back to sketches as far back as like 99 and 2000, like 20 plus years that literally on some of the pages, it was just like, I would do a sketch and I'd be like, what the fuck is this bullshit? Like I write things like that. I'm very honest with myself and my sketchbooks are filled with, with. I, mean, I, I love your sketchbooks because it's, like, <laughs> it's like a comedy show inside of it. You just talking shit to yourself. I always yeah. love that. I have to be on. I mean, as an artist, if you're not honest with yourself, yeah. you got, you really need to go look in the mirror because everything we do is not fucking great. And if everyone tells you everything you do is great, quit fucking talking to those people because they're, they don't understand. I mean, they're being nice, you know, yeah. and as a collector, it's really flattering for people to tell me that I'm a great artist. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's wonderful. It feels great. But at the same time, it feels strange because I'm taking this amazing compliment from someone who may not actually understand the, the difficulties of doing what it is I'm doing. And so they're complimenting it from a surface level, which is great. And I really do. I truly do appreciate it. But when another artist that I work, that I admire says something like, Hey man, um, that new thing you're doing, like, I really like this style. Or I really like this thing, knowing that they know how hard it is to do it. Yeah. It's like, that's the encouragement that we should be giving each other as artists. We shouldn't be talking shit about each other. Even if I don't like the particular thing you're doing, as a craftsperson, I should be able to look at what you're doing and pick out parts of the craft or parts of the style or parts of the subject matter that inspire me and make me feel like, holy shit, man, Chuck's over here. Like, I don't like the thing Chuck's drawing, but the way he fucking drew it is amazing. And so I would reach out to you. And instead of being like, yo, bro, I wish you would draw something cool in that style. I would reach out to you and be like, hey, man, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but that new style you did fucking kills. I know you got only three likes on it, but do not let that discourage you because you, yeah. that's the shit. That's the next step for you. Keep yeah. going. Fuck all these people. No one wants to buy it. Fuck them. They're going to be coming. They're going to be lined up around the fucking block next year when they get, when they evolve to meet up with what you're doing. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm a person who I really do reach out very, very often to artists that I see in that position where they went from getting a thousand likes on every post to getting 10 likes. And I know some of that's algorithm based problems that we're all yeah. facing because the algorithms are basically like a clusterfuck and they don't want anybody to succeed unless you're, unless you're politically volatile, you know? Um, yeah. So I try to, to encourage artists because I have people who encourage me. And so I know how important it is, you know, and when young artists reach out to me, I answer their emails. I, I usually just send them my phone number and be like, look, I got fucking gorilla fingers. I don't type very well. Call me and let's just talk. Yeah. Because to me, I have no secrets. And that's the reason I make my brushes that I wanted for everyone else, because I kind of live by a little bit of a rule. And I learned this in the airbrush shop. The first couple of people I tried to talk to about airbrushing when I was a kid, I mean, I'm a kid and they fucking like shut me out. Like, I'm not telling you anything, kid, go fucking learn it your own self. And that's just the old school approach, right? Yep. And to me, all of those old school guys that treated everyone that way is because they weren't sure. They didn't real have real confidence. They were just basing it on pride or off of like the fact that if, if I teach this kid something, what if he's better than me? Well, to me, that just means you're a good teacher. You yep. know what I mean? But to them, it meant they was going to take bread off their table. Someone else was going to get that $20 bill. And I've never felt that way because if I can show you something or tell you something in a phone call or in a, a couple of painting lessons that make you better than me, that's my problem. I'm the one that needs to grow. 
You know what well, I mean? If I'm doing some shit that's so simple, I can teach you in five minutes and you're better than me. Well, fuck now I need to be getting lessons from you. And so it was gross. I think yeah. these discussions before about you're motivating each other. And yeah. as it continues growth, you're getting better as you know, that other person is getting better. Everybody's yeah. growing together, especially with our, you know, our community is such a small community to begin with, you know, in a custom culture world, whether it be hot rods, bikes, you know, what, whatever it be, um, art, art and everything else is such a small world. We have to support each other, you know, and I think you're doing the right, right thing that way, you know, reaching out to those artists and talking to everybody and just having an open discussion about what's going on, you know? Yeah. And I always want to be, I want to be the lowest guy in the room. Like if I, if I'm the smartest guy or the most creative guy in the room, we're fucked. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I want to be the guy who's in the room and I feel like I probably don't deserve to be there. And yeah. I feel that way, even in a room full of people who with a third or a, a, even first year, two year people, like people who have, they're just getting started. And I've been at this, you know, since dinosaurs had training wheels. And I still feel like that I'm learning something from every person I'm around. And if I'm not learning something from them and they're not learning something from me, then what the fuck are we doing? We just sit yeah. around jerking each other off, you know, and it's like, I want to learn some shit. And so I'm trying to learn it. If I don't have someone in the, you know, in my near vicinity that I can sort of feed energy off of, then I try to do that for myself. And that's where a lot of this experimentation with my art and styles and color palettes and subject matter and all that come from is that I want to, I want to grow. And so the internet has been really great at that because if you want to feel like you should be flipping burgers, fucking go on the internet, you will find 12 year old kids that can fucking paint circles around you. Yeah. And, and to me, that's a blessing and a curse because you constantly feel challenged, but it's very discouraging. If you're not confident, if you're not, if you don't have an established level of confidence in your art and that you've built up over a period of time, or that you just kind of naturally sort of feel like that you're doing something that's relevant. The internet will fucking put the stomp right on your ass, bro. It will put the emergency brake on quicker than, than hugging you can think. <laughs> And so I love it and I hate it at the same time. So it's a, it's a great tool. And um, just real quick, I want to say something that yeah, I usually um, talk to people when I do talks in person or if I do like a, if I meet a class or something, I tell people all the time. And this is a little bit off subject. It does have to do with the internet. But if you're starting off on a piece of art, for instance, if you want to draw some car painting or, or some car drawing or some monster or anything, Anything you're going to draw, fucking put your ideas down on paper before you go fucking look at Google. You know what I mean? Don't look up reference before you put your idea down because reference is the creativity killer. You use reference to refine an idea if you feel like it's necessary. Mm. If you're just using reference all the time, unless you're doing photorealism, obviously you should have reference because there's a lot of like really micro details that make a difference in photorealism. But if you're not doing photorealism, quit fucking going to Google search first. And here's why you're going to get the same top 10 results that every other motherfucker on earth that's typed in 57 Chevy got. And so that means your art starts off already from conception, looking like everybody else's. Yeah. And it's difficult to modify that at that point because you've already gone down that road but let's just say you want to do that and you just sketch up what you remember a 57 chevy looks like and obviously that's just a first example that popped in my head and you draw it up and then you look on google and you're like this looks more like a fucking 69 camaro than a 57 chevy well guess what maybe you just invented something fucking way cooler than just a basic fucking 57 chevy that everyone else is going to find when they do a google search yeah. right so to me that's where creativity happens is outside of the influence of reference material, because then your brain has to interpret what you remember or you think of it as. Yeah. And oftentimes that's where the, 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 those creative leaps come from or accidental genius is what I call it. And my art career wouldn't even exist probably if I had the internet when I was airbrushing, because I would have never had to sit there. And as my, as the other airbrushers call me the human encyclopedia, because I would just come up with any fucking thing. And it was rarely accurate, but it was accurate enough because that person didn't know exactly all the details either. And if yeah. I can give them like two thirds of what they think it looks like, they're like, this fucking guy's a genius. But if they went and looked at it on the internet, they'd be like, this is bullshit. 
This ain't a fucking, this ain't a 57 Chevy. What the fuck is this? But because I didn't have that thing telling me I was wrong all the time. Yeah. I built, I built up a confidence in digging through my own mind and using that as my initial reference material is what I remember. And then, for instance, if I do, I keep using the same example, 57 Chevy, right? If I make some drawing and I'm like, I know this is kind of close, but I, I really would like to get the grill a little bit more accurate. Then I'll yeah. go on Google and I'll type in. I'm like, oh, fuck, I see. I forgot the little the little center marks or I forgot this little piece here that yeah. changed it. And then I turn it off because I want to let that process through and marinate in my own bullshit sauce and yeah. then put it on paper. Because even though then it'll be closer to accurate, it's still mine. Or I say mine. It's got my stank on it. Right. Yeah, it's got your style. I do the same kind of thing. Some when I think about building a hot rod or something like that, you know, I have like this kind of concept in my head because kind of like what you said, you, um, you remember something a certain way yeah, right? and you remember that and you, when you go to do a drawing or build a car or have an idea for a car, there are certain ideas that you have in your head, but when you start Googling it, you're going to, it'll skew that, you know, it'll and, wipe it out. Yeah. <laughs> Just um, it'll erase it. And that's why I love working with artists like that too, just because I, I work a lot designing, especially designing cars with uh, Chris Piscatelli. Okay. Me and him will bounce ideas around and stuff. And we do all that before we look anything up. I'm like, hey, I have this idea. And he's an artist. He's a you know car designer by trade, basically. And so he'll be like, oh, this will work like this or whatever. And um, you know, we do all that before we even start looking at any kind of style of that hot rod or whatever it is online. Um, I, I like working that way, you know, kind of what you were saying. I don't know if that made any sense or if I just ranted for no reason. No, no, no. And then you end up you end up with details that no one's seen before because you yeah. misinterpreted something that was in your mind. Or yeah. when you looked at something, you misinterpreted what they had done. Yeah. And you have a totally different idea. But if you go back and look at theirs, you're gonna be like, well, fuck, now I gotta do it that way because now I know. Yeah. And it, it eliminates the possibility for accidental creativity yeah. and accidental growth. And yeah. I think of it this way when I was a kid, my dad was an asshole, but I, I mean we're good. I love him. I'm glad he's an asshole because looking at that people who didn't have a dad who put a foot in their ass, I, I, I fear for them. So I'm glad my dad put his foot in my ass. But when I was a kid, if I went to my mom or my dad, my mom, because she was stoned out of her mind. And so she just was like creative and silly hippie chick. But my dad was just this rigid asshole. If I went to him, I'd be like, Hey dad, I want to, I want a sailboat. Like I want a toy sailboat. He'd be like, we'll go in the, go in the shop and make one. I'd be like, I don't know how to make one. He'd be like, well, how the hell are you going to learn if you don't try? Yeah. And I'd be like, okay. And he'd be like, how about this? Go try. If you can't figure it out, I'll come help you. And if, then if we can't figure it out, then we'll buy one. How about that? And it's that exact same mentality. Go yeah. fucking try first. And then yep. once you feel like you've met your end, ask somebody else if they can look at it and give you like, like be like, dude, Chuck, this is supposed to be this thing. Am I just fucking totally back asswards? And you might look at it and be like, dude, all you're missing is this particular thing. And then neither of us have looked at reference, but we've just created something that might be a little bit newer version or a little bit more interesting version of this particular thing that everyone's already very familiar with. Yeah. Because when you picture an item in your head, you're not picturing an eidetic memory type picture. You're not doing a photographic memory. Yeah. You're thinking of sort of your interpretation of that particular thing. Exactly. And being able to put that on paper is where creativity happens. Simply copying it is just that you're copying something and you eliminate a lot of the chances for creativity. And sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I feel like it's really important because a lot of young artists feel like it's, it's best to copy things in order to develop a style. And it's almost the absolute opposite. The way you're going to develop a style is by looking at the reference in your own head, because what you see is going to be different than everyone else's. Even yeah. if it's 90% the same, that extra 10%, that's your funk. That's your style. That's what makes you look across the room and go, oh, that's one of those stupid Tidwell drawings. No matter if it's a bicycle, a yep. skull, a car, a fucking tree, no matter what you see, if you see it, you'd be like, okay, I think that's that dude. That, that's that's yep. his. Even though it's completely different subject matter, it's because of that simple thing. Everything that I draw is processed through my stupid brain before it's, it's – um, uh, modified or sort of quality control checked against the actual item. 
you know. And oftentimes I'll look at something and I'm like, yeah, that's completely fucked, but I kind of like mine better. <laughs> and so you have to also be confident enough to feel that way. Like if you draw something and it's, and then you look at the reference and you're like, dude, I totally jacked that up. You know, well, your, uh, your skulls are even, I think, I don't know, Johnny, I think he's got a couple of them, but your skulls are even different than anybody else's skulls that you've done before. You know, um, I know we've been chatting for a while. Me and you could chat forever and I love it. But even like your skulls are always, they have a little bit of fill to them, you know? I just try to make, like I said, I, I literally try to make the dumb shit that I want to see. Yeah. You know? Like, for instance, this page that we ha that he has up here. If you look at that, the the Evil Knievel guy, that's pretty traditional, you know, like Mad Magazine, cartoons, Roth, like that whole custom culture aspect, that whole side, because you got the exaggerated forms, you got the flying eyeball, you got the, the slicks, and you got the you know, the rock and rollness of being a kid with a broken arm and still being stupid and all that. And on the other side, you have what I would consider to be a little bit more serious of a piece, but it's completely from a different world. It's from like a, an old school graffiti scene like New York City. And like I call that King of New York. And it, most people don't understand why, but the crown, there's a little bit of New York hiding behind the, the, cruise, the, behind the cross, right? But it's like, to me, both of those are exactly the same time period this is like early 80s and these are two totally different worlds but to me they're exactly the same because i was i was in the middle of that like i was that ed roth kid you know that cartoons magazine mad magazine kid who was out trying to kill myself with every rat trap fucking rusty thing but then i was also stealing cans of spray paint and going spray painting things you know what i mean like i was in the middle and then like here go back one johnny if you don't mind that one like for instance this this started off as a, and it's in the same book, as a bicycle. I wanted to draw a Grim Reaper on like a lowrider bicycle. But as soon as I draw it, drew it with that Springer, like that sickle Springer fork, I don't know if you noticed those are sickle blades. I, did. I was like, this should be a chopper. It's going to be way cooler as a chopper yeah. than as a bicycle. So I was like, fuck it, I'm going to do both. So I basically just added a motor, added the sissy bar and a couple of other things. And it's exactly the same drawing, like, 60% of it is exactly the same drawing, but it's for two completely different people, you know? Yeah. And, um, I don't know, but maybe it's not, maybe it's for the kid who had the old Schwinn looking bike with the Springer on it or whatever it was. And then he grew up and built this, you know, fucking chopper. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like to me, it's all the same. It's just, but they all have your, they still have what you said earlier. They have your style. That is, you know, it's for what you said, to use your words, it's got your skank on it or stank or whatever. Yeah. You and know. That's, that's all I bring to the table is that I just add a little two cents to things that other people have already seen or have already done. And I'm not, I'm not copying people necessarily. Like, obviously I'm not trying to copy people. Um, but, you know, like, pinstriping and flying eyeballs and all that shit it has been around since egyptian times so what the fuck do i have to add to it if i if i don't have my own little stink like if what am i going to do i'm not going to reinvent it you know like i'm one of these people that that believes that there are almost no new ideas in art it's just yeah. basically adding to existing ideas like you know evolving old ideas and so that's I basically built my career around it. So anybody out there who thinks that I'm sitting around thinking I'm some fucking creative genius, I do not think that at all. <laughs> you know, I, I just, because I'm very realistic. I look in the mirror and I see me. I don't see somebody who I'm not, or I don't try to be anybody I'm not. It's just, I just want to be able to draw things that make me and other people smile. That's it. Yeah. It's not emotional. It's not philosophical. It's just, I'm just trying to have fun and keep myself from being bored and boring my audience. Yeah, well, I don't think I don't think you're uh, boring your audience. You've changed your style, your art, and everything else so many times. I, I think uh, I think uh, you got anybody you want to give a shout out for to before we wrap this up, and then I got we do have to talk about one thing first. Johnny, okay. can you pull a picture of that haircut? Oh, bro, dude. Okay, I, I got to talk about this haircut. You sent so, this to me this morning, and I just I was rolling, dying. So I decided the the name of this haircut is the spider hawk mullet and this is our this is my son our son right. Edison. he's five years old and he came up with this haircut himself yeah did he trademark it i, I wish that's that thing's glorious 
Um, and he had just woken up and he was like, come back to look at the dogs. And he was, I was like, dude, let me take a picture. He hates when I take pictures. So he's just like, Oh, so that's why he looks so like punk rock, like fuck you dad. But <laughs> he is like this kid. I'm very fortunate that the stupid apple didn't fall very far from the tree. And he literally believes that just like when I was a kid, my parents told me I didn't listen to shit. I didn't want to hear any. I I had my own ideas about everything. He's exactly the same way. And I couldn't be happier. I'm glad he's a pain in the ass because if he was boring, I'd be bored. I would, I'd be wishing he was, you know, doing something crazy, but he decided that's the haircut he wants. And so we were like, okay, let's go do it. I can't wait to see a skull drawing with a haircut like that. (laughs) I need to do one. Yeah. But no, dude, that kid's five years old and he's cooler than I'll ever be in my entire existence. Well, I will, um, I'm not going to disagree with that. <laughs> so, so you had asked me earlier and I did not answer this. I think I went off on some stupid tangent, which I'm really bad at doing. You ask if there are any people that I feel like are really killing it. And yeah. obviously there's a million people. And if I say five people, it's going to be the, there's going to be 50 other people going to be like, yo, bro, I thought we were friends. You didn't say shit, you know, but if I can throw out a couple of people, obviously I think what my wife is doing is amazing. You know, yeah. um, Sarah, um, and Sarah, uh, uh, her, she's, uh, uh, inked, inked dragon.com. The, the inking dragon. The inking dragon. Okay. Yeah. And, um, on Instagram, I think she's just inky dragon. Inky dragon. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, for instance, there's a, um, I mean, I, I, I know hot rod Jen, said something to me earlier but like as far as skills go if i could pinstripe one tenth as good as she can i could take over the fucking world yeah you know what i mean like so as far as pinstriping goes i do not even consider myself a pinstriper at all i never really have um so when i see someone that's like her or little dame or any of these like amazing pinstripers i know i'm forgetting a million people like i can't even i can't even fathom that level of dedication to that craft. You know what I mean? Like I'm so ADHD, like I I would be, I'm off on a whole nother planet. So of course the, you know, a lot of people that are in our genre are just killing it. Like amazing artists. Obviously there are people, you know, Oh my gosh, I feel so weird when I have to answer these questions, but um, let's, let's step out of my genre. So they're less likely to come to my house and beat me up. Um, if, if I could, if I was going to just say, Chuck, here are a couple of artists you should definitely check out. Um, yeah, one of, go one, with that question. Who do you think of, I should check out? One of them would be James Jean. Um, um, one of them would be um, Zach Matthews. One of them would be um, Ben Kwok. Um, um, ja Cooper. She's an amazing artist. Um, um, Tara McPherson's an amazing artist. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of artists that, you know, I'm not thinking of right at the top of my head, but there are so many amazing artists. And um, one of the things that I really like about the modern sort of art movement or contemporary artists is that it's no longer just a sausage club. Yeah. That I love the fact that all of these creative voices are coming from everyone. You know, at one point you walk into a hot rod show and it's like 30 dudes carrying pinstriping boxes. Yeah. And none of us were really that great. But we were the only like we just we we made it a boys club. And I think that a lot of things were I didn't make it that way. I just kind of came into it, obviously. But I love the idea that we have so many different voices from uh, men, women, children, you know, every different group around the world. Everybody has a voice now. And I find that the people that I am following and like just like excited to see their next post um, more than half of them are female artists and yeah. it's because they're bringing in again, a fresh perspective that has been missing from this sausage party. That's been the, the art world in the hot rod scene for the last you know 50 years. And they're killing, they're killing it, man, like inspiring the shit out of them. And then people like, um, I mean, even people that are, are like a little bit off the, the side in different worlds, like for instance, Crayola graffiti guy, gone fine artist, like super great guy, super good just a good friend, good artist, amazing everything. People like Rock and Jelly Bean are just have a completely different perspective on everything, you know? Um, like um, Dan Brown, the guy I was telling you about with these paintings, some of the paintings I showed you, auto expressionist. Um, he is like a classically trained artist who's a hot rodder. So he makes these expressionist paintings of cars, which are 
fucking gorgeous. I have them all over my house. I think I have five of them, you know, and then like, and then some traditional guys, like I'm looking here next to me, like McPhail, um, James Owen, like food of my, um, like, um, Johnny Crap, all these people that just do amazing art, like right above me, you know, I've got um, Mr. G, um, Damien Fulton, Johnny Crap, like all these people just like all around. It's like so many artists now were all so visible to each other and yeah. it's super inspiring and it's just amazing. And I'm sure I forgot somebody who I should be thinking of, probably somebody sitting right over here. I don't even know, but like, it's just sure come to your house and beat you up for it. And then like, you know, the, the guys that have been around since, you know, that I looked up to like Franco and Wiesner and all these guys and, and Max Grundy and all these guys that I just like, you know, and um, you know, I don't know, man, guys like scratch that are just like tried and true that have just been in it and just keep doing it. And they don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks, you know, you, you just have to admire that sort of tenacity and that sort of confidence in what you're doing. And yeah. um and, you know, I aspire to be like that. I aspire to, to be confident enough to just keep making art. And so, you know, and if there are people who look at me as that person, like I'm it's amazed. I'm amazed because I, I still think of myself as like I'm learning something new every time I pick up a pencil, every time I pick up a paintbrush. And, you know, I've been learning about um, using iPad Pro to 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 do drawings and stuff. And that's been really cool. Um, but again, it, it's a, it's just learning a new tool you know, just like learning about airbrushing or pinstriping or sign lettering or anything like that. The other night when we talked to, to do a preview of this, I just finished up doing a sign painting job that my wife had gotten and I was just helping her with the lettering. And it's like, I don't know. It's so, it feels so good to get back on lettering on signboard. And it's like, fuck, I might want to do some new signs and I haven't wanted to do lettering jobs in forever. And yeah. now I'm like, maybe I'll, I'll call up a couple of my friends who've been asking me to do like, um, you know, like car show, like sandwich boards and stuff like that. I'm like, maybe I'll call up and just, you know, refresh those skills. Like get, bring yeah. that skill set back out of the woodwork, you know? So I don't know. Sorry if I'm just ranting. I sound like something. Oh, I love it. it Me, every time we talk, we can always talk for hours and everything else. We'll definitely have to get you back on the, on the show sometime soon. We'll chit chat about all, I got all kinds of questions and random things I'd love to talk to you about. Well, dude, uh, I really appreciate it. And, I, I really appreciate everyone who's listening. I'm all three of you, <laughs> but no, I it just, it's really amazing that I have an opportunity to do what I do and that people actually give a shit. And that's, that's really um, it's, it's humbling. And I, I just want everyone that's listening to know that every time I'm doing something, I'm trying to earn that trust. I'm trying to earn that place that, that makes it worth your time to come and see what kind of dumb shit I'm making. Yeah. And, and I think that every artist could benefit from getting a little bit of that into their life, just getting a little bit of that. I need to earn it into their life because just sitting around telling yourself you're the best artist or listening to your, your immediate family tell you you're the best artist in the world. It's not going to make you grow. You got to get out here in the big, I'd rather be a piece of plankton in the ocean than a big fish in a little pond. You know what I mean? And I think that that's where growth happens is when you get out there in, in the fucking thick of it and you got to fight. That's where it happens. So. It's always about growth. Yeah, it really is, man. And uh, I hope I didn't like sound like a broken fucking record. I do that. I get off on ideas, and but um, so, that's why know. I always love talking to you because you always there's always something new to talk about. And uh, we'll, we'll get you back on here sometime soon. You got any shout outs you want to give to before we cut you loose? Um, I mean, I appreciate you guys having me. I appreciate Mac Brush for supporting all my stupid ideas and. Um, I'm not affiliated with any kind of paint companies or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't have any of that shit, but I am constantly making new shit. So if you're, if you're interested in following along with my stupidity journey, you know, then, um, and maybe finding some new shit you might like, have a look over at my website or my Instagram or whatever the fuck. Um, I think my Instagram is oh, art boy Tidwell. Yeah. That's my, that's my website, humantree.com. But, yeah, I think uh, your uh, your Instagram's at art art boy art boy Tidwell. Yeah, art yeah. boy Tidwell. Yeah, um, uh, and I try to keep that updated. I'm not really a, a super big social media person, um, mainly because if I have time to do that, I'd rather just go ride my bike or go hang out with the kid or chase my wife around naked or something. You know, whatever I can get myself into. Um, so I don't post a super lot, but when I do post, I try to make it something that is it's worth 
the, the 30 seconds of someone having to take a look at it, you know? Yeah. So I try not to just post shit like what I'm eating or any of that kind of bullshit. Like I want to just be like, here's a piece of art. I'll see you in a week. You know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but, um, but yeah, man. And, um, and if anyone ever wants to get me, like really you can go to my website, shoot me a message. You can go to Instagram, anywhere you want to shoot me a message. Um, and I really do try to answer everybody. Like I'm not one of these assholes that, you know, I don't get like 50,000 messages. So it's still easy for me to go through and answer every message and, if you have any questions or if you want me to expand upon anything that's talked about tonight, then uh, obviously reach out to me and we'll, we'll chat. I'll call you or you can call me or we'll just, if it's short enough, I email you or something. I'm easy. I'm not, I'm not hiding and I have no secrets. So hit me up. <laughs> no. Now, I, now just for the record, I told that to, to Chuck and I started getting these really weird pictures in my, my DM. So none of that, please. You told me you had a toe fetish. It was lots of pictures of what I thought were thumbs and mushrooms, but I, I may be mistaken. <laughs> oh, all right. We're going to, this, that, this is where the show ends. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's about to go off the rails right here. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's just you know, about the time hour, 45 minutes. Every time with you, it goes off the rails. Yeah. There we go. It's, oh man. but no, I, I appreciate, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the life I've got. I appreciate everybody who's listening and paying attention and buying my stupid shit. So <clears throat> thanks everyone. Well, I appreciate your brother. Thanks for being on. Uh, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, really happy for we hit a thousand subscribers today. We may be a little bit over today on YouTube, so that's awesome. We appreciate everybody. You know, like, subscribe, comment, share with your friends, tell everybody. I think we're Johnny, are we still 30% off till tonight? Is it or am I off a little bit on that? There we go. There you go. Use gnarly thirty at checkout, save thirty percent off of everything in the store. Buy some stuff so we can keep sitting here and talking to you guys about all the shenanigans. But, by the uh, way, just real quick, if you don't mind me saying, um, gnarly has been to me like what a lot of these highbrow art magazines wish they were. Like it is real people doing real shit and some really fucking progressive like creative shit going on in there and it's really cool because it's a bunch of idiots that i know and that know me and none of us think we're doing anything and then we see it in press and we're like holy shit dude that's really sick like that's you know like it's i really appreciate it because there are not a lot of people that are still putting out actual physical magazines and for like you guys, yeah just like that one <laughs> and for people to be and, and i'm not trying to blow smoke it legit everyone knows that magazines are hard to come by these days, especially yeah. a magazine that's not just ads, you know, and I don't, I don't want to bust anybody's balls, but the couple of mainstream art magazines, if you go pick them up, the last one I got, um, page 29 was the first piece of artwork that wasn't an ad. Yeah. And that's bullshit, especially when you're paying $8.99 for a fucking magazine and you, the first 29, 28 pages are ads. It's like, okay, then why aren't you giving these magazines away for free? You obviously just got a fucking ton of revenue from ads, you know? It's like, so I love the fact that you guys are very reasonable with your ad space and you pack every fucking page with some idiot like me that loves not only creating this shit, but seeing it being created. So kudos to you guys for still sticking in there because I know it can't be cheap or easy. Well, we love idiots like you. I appreciate it. That sounded like that sounded like a fluff piece, but it's legit. Like I, when I look no, at it, I'm like, oh, this is rad, dude. You know, I look forward to seeing them. So it's like yeah. that's that means something, you know. <laughs> All right, appreciate chat. We'll we'll get you on again. I can't wait to chat with you again. I'm sure I'll talk to you soon anyway. Yeah, but already. Oh, good. Yeah. I was just gonna say sorry for fucking rattling along all the time. <laughs> I love your rattling. <laughs> already. <laughs> So I'm out of here. See you guys. Thanks, everybody.